Welcome to Between Two Speakers. I'm Randy Ford. I'm a writer and storytelling strategist at First Story Strategies. And I'm Mariana Swallow. I'm a public speaking coach and instructor of business and professional speaking at Loyola University. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today, I'm really excited about our topic today, Randy, because what we're going to share with you are our top five favorite fictional speakers. And the reason why I love this is because I believe that there's a lot to learn from pop culture, but especially when we see people who need to make speeches or run meetings or trainings on TV and in movies, I think we can learn a lot from the ones who are good and the ones who are bad. Why do you like this topic, Randy? Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right, you know, and, and it's also often um, exaggerated beyond what actual in-person speaking is like or even video speaking one-to-one. -one. And True. so that provides some insight into things that, are, are, that work and things that, that don't. I'm mm -hmm. excited about this thing. It's going to be fun. I think so, too. Well, why don't we just jump right into it? Uh, we're going to start with number five. And number five is one of my favorites for good and bad reasons. Coming in at number five is David Brent from the original office in the UK. And Randy, I love David Brent because I wish I could take that arrogant confidence he has and just give it to every single one of my students. What blows me away is David Brent is confident even when he has no reason to be and he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. Whereas a lot of the clients I work with and even some of my students will say, oh, I don't know enough or I haven't researched enough and that's not the point. Uh, David will wear jeans and a t-shirt to a corporate presentation and he thinks nothing of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he, he, that confidence, and then, you know, you see it in, in Michael Scott, too, of course, in the U U.S. version, but really, Ricky Gervais really sells that. Yeah, the, the overconfidence, which I wish I could take an eyedropper and give that to my clients, but I will tell you one of the things that I don't like about David Brent. In the episode where he did make a motivational speech, he was doing all this false over-the-top stuff and the audience was clearly bored and they weren't enjoying him, but he didn't respond to it. So if you're going to learn something from David Brent, I say be confident, even if you have to fake it a little bit, but don't ignore your audience. Pay attention to your audience and their reactions and read the room. And I think that's a great example of what we were saying about it being exaggerated. Of course, that was an effect for TV mm -hmm. uh, that the audience was reacting that way. Right. That, to an extreme level, but it's a good reminder for us that really, even if people aren't um, reacting to that level, if they are not giving you that energy back that you're giving, then it's time to adjust something. Absolutely, absolutely. So you have a number four for us. Who's coming in at number four? Four at this list, Albus Dumbledore. Uh, now I know you're not a Harry Potter person, right? I'm not, I would like to be, but uh, I'm familiar with one of his famous speeches. Sure, yeah. Well, um, let's start at the beginning. There's an 11-year-old boy, and then he finds out. No, no, I'm not going to tell you the whole thing, but <laughs> of course I love the books. The movies are, are good, some of them better than others. Um, I love the audiobooks, and I, there are several versions, but especially the ones that are narrated by Jim Dale mm. are just wonderful. But in all of them, in the written form, movies and the audio, um, Albus Dumbledore just comes across as this amazing speaker. Now, he is the headmaster of the school that Harry goes to, and he's also known as really the wisest wizard in all of the wizarding world. But what's great about his speeches, uh, and he gives one typically at the beginning of every school year to, uh, to the new students, is he is very reserved the things that, you know, he knows everything there is and he knows secrets that we will never learn. Some we do learn are big secrets that he's been holding, but everything is reserved and he is sharing only what needs to be shared. Mm -hmm. The other thing that is reserved is his use of humor. Uh, he is, is funny and does have a sense of humor, but he doesn't go for over the top yuck mm -hmm. yuck joke. So the do that I've find when I think about him as a speaker is uh, do edit yourself and realize that this is not the time that you have to share everything you know or even everything that you need your audience to know that there wow. are opportunities to do that if, if we learn something from him not to do it I would say no other public speaker can can uh, <laughs> assume the the kind of flair that we allow Albus Dumbledore to have. I, I agree. Probably don't show up in a, a wizard robe and, and cap. Uh, 
But what I would like to add to that, what I love about him, yes, I agree with the reserved because I often find it difficult to explain to my students that you don't have to be an over the top gregarious personality like Oprah Winfrey. You can be low key and still be a commanding speaker. And I think Dumbledore is an excellent example of this. Yeah, um, yeah. it's all about being your authentic self. If you're not uh, somebody who brings David Brent level energy or, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, uh, Albus Dumbledore flair to your daily life, right. then it's not going to translate well when you're at a podium or in front of people. Absolutely. And I got to say, I love his choice of words. You can tell he's deliberate. And I think my favorite quote was, let me speak to you before we are befuddled by this excellent feast. Yes, <laughs> it's a wonderful line. I want to pull that out at my next dinner party, you know, when we get to do those again. Why wait till dinner party? Just do it with yourself at lunch. I will. I will. <laughs> Thanks. All right, let's move on to number three. Uh, someone who presents every now and then as part of her work on the series Insecure is Issa D, played by Issa Rae. And I absolutely love Issa because I think, she, especially when she's presenting, she shows the range of how we really are at work. Um, when she's prepared, she's prepared and polished. But when she has a challenging audience, such as in season one, episode one of Insecure, uh, she's speaking to a classroom of, I think, like sixth graders, and they keep challenging her. And, and um, some of the comments they made, I just absolutely can't repeat here. But they'll say things like, why is your hair so funny? And why are you wearing those ugly clothes? And Issa just holds it together, even when her audience is pissing her off. And I hate to admit it, but you know, we've all been in those situations, myself included, and you gotta stay professional even when things aren't going your way. Absolutely. You know, I, I was not familiar with that show and you have me hooked because you did show me that opening scene that you're talking about before we, we started recording today and I, I loved it. I fell in love with her as a character and talk about authenticity, um, especially when she finally realizes, okay, I, I've got to like, I'm, I'm losing the audience with these kids mm -hmm. decides, okay, look, I'm just, I'm going to be who I am. And this is, I'm going to tell you like it is. And I loved that moment. Yeah. Yeah. I love when she does kind of lose it, but she keeps it together and she says, okay, you want to know about me? I'm 28. I'm not married. Today's my birthday. Probably just going to get dinner tonight. And she's very, uh, she's still her authentic self, but she maintains that professionalism. Yeah. Um, Another episode, which there's not a clip for, but I would like to reference listeners to, um, there's another episode in season four where she's planning a block party, but when she has a, a fundraiser to get business owners to come and, and support the event, um, she gets so caught up in trying to please everyone there. So you see her going from table to table, and when people are asking her, what's this block party about? The person who's concerned about racism, she says, well, it's anti-racism. The person who cares about uh, funding programs for children, she goes, well, it's, 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 we're going to fund programs for children. And she keeps trying to like please everyone there. And then when she goes to make her speech, she realizes, I can't say these 25 things. It's similar, Randy, to the issue you had when you were working for the congressman and everyone wanted him to say everything. And Issa got up on stage, said, you guys, look, I'm just going to be honest with you. I am doing this because I care about the community. And, you know, it's, it's, again, being your authentic self. So I just, I love when she has to make a speech on Insecure. Yeah, and that's, that's a great example. Uh, I, I can't wait to get to that episode now that I'm going to be binging this. <laughs> right. It, it also gets to something we've talked about before in a previous episode of this about um, the audience and what an audience is bringing to something. Mm -hmm. She was speaking to a bunch of different audiences at once. Yeah. Each of their own story and perspective. And she, as the speaker, had to bring that together. And 